yeah, nice to be back with you all this afternoon um, and to have had lunch with you guys in here and uh, nice to see you online as well. So, as we said, we're going to look at God's amazing promises for a few minutes this afternoon. Um, if you want to turn to Genesis 12, that's where we're going to start. Um, if you don't mind, there's going to be quite a bit of getting our Bibles open and, and turning to, to different passages. Um, the plan is what we're going to do, run through um, in order in the scriptures where God's promises uh, are revealed to, to mankind. Um, a lot of that is in the Old Testament, um, a lot of, uh, and in Genesis, um, and we're going to spend some time going through that. And just bear with that process because it may seem of some of them a bit repetitive or you might be thinking this isn't relevant to me. But as we come towards the end of the talk, um, we're going to see how all these amazing promises um, are very much relevant for us today as well. Um, hence the word uh, uh, amazing to, to use in this, in this talk. Um, so what is a promise uh, in the Bible? It's um, the word is a covenant or a pledge from God. Um, something that he says he's going to do. Something that we can trust in. Sometimes it's faith dependent. It's dependent on a response of an individual. And sometimes it is just um, is God given. And these promises, these covenants, um, they reveal God's plan for mankind, um, for us, and what our hope for the future is. And hope for the future for, from all those that are, have gone before us that we, we read about in this amazing book. So Genesis chapter 12 that we're going to start in. Um, now we see that in verse 1, the, uh, and I'm in, um, I'm in King James now this afternoon. Uh, the Lord uh, had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So there's a land that, that he's got to go to, and um, this isn't a promise here. This is this is a faithful response, as we've kind of talked about, um, only just. He, he had to do a faithful act of getting up and leaving where he was um, to come to this land. Verse 2, what does God say, what does he then promise will happen if, if, this, if, if Abraham does this? I will make of thee a great nation. Uh, I will bless thee. I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So here we have the first set of covenants or promises um, in the scriptures to Abraham here. So we see a great nation, um, he's going to be blessed, uh, his name will be a blessing, those that curse him will be cursed. Um, some quite amazing things that are promised to him. Uh, and it goes on. We come down to verse 7. Um, the Lord appears to Abraham, to, to Abraham, sorry, at this stage, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord. Um, so this land that he's been promised, here we get a bit more detail. It's actually going to be promised to Abraham's seed. Um, and we'll, we'll see this later, but this here is... Um, a singular word, seed, singular, not multiple seed, not all of these amazing descendants that Abraham's going to have. This is to the one seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. This land is going to be his. Okay, And, and when we're starting to talk about our hope for the future, we, of course, are waiting for that time still for our Lord Jesus to return. Um, so we're, we're starting to see that this prom these promises on initial reading are to a man, you know, th th was it 4,000 years ago now, maybe five Um Oh, then they're not relevant. Well, we're, we're waiting for this promise to happen, um, for Jesus to, to inherit the land. Um, okay, so that's, that's the building blocks now. That's the first set of promises that God appears to Abraham, and that's the first set of promises that are given. So we're going to come forward and we're going to trace these through now. So we're going to come to Genesis 13 next. We're going to see how um, a lot of them are to Abraham, but as we go through, the promises build. God builds on what he's, he's shown to Abraham and to others um, as we build into this crescendo in the New Testament of what it means for us. So briefly stopping in Genesis 13, um, they've come out of Egypt now um, and they're at Bethel and, and Lot's just departed um, to go towards the land of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. What does God say to, to Abraham this time in verse 14? The Lord said to Abraham, 
after the lot was separated from him. Now Abram, lift up thine eyes, look from the place where thou art, where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, there's that singular word again, forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So we have this same land promised to the seed, Jesus Christ. Um, and then we have um, it talk about the actual physical descendants of Abraham, that they're going to be so numerous, um, the people that come from him afterwards, from his family and beyond, that they're going to be um, as, as a number of the dust of the earth, that they're going to be so many, this, this physical seed um, that's going to come from him. So come forward again now with me to Genesis 15. Again, we see the promises repeated. Now, in this chapter, we're starting to see highlighted, if not already, how important these promises are. When we start to see repetition from God, we know that it's something um, very meaningful. Uh, and here in this chapter, we have the phrase, the word of the Lord. And it's the first time um, this phrase is used. It's a phrase that you'll recognize for those of you who done any kind of Bible Bible readings for the, for the prophets, it's what's used when the word of the Lord came to Haggai or, or you know, it's, it's the phrase that's used with the prophets. Um, and we know later on uh, in Genesis 20 and verse 7 that Abimelech is told that Abraham is a prophet. So it's signifying here the importance of this passage. Abraham is a prophet here now um, and the word of the Lord is coming to him. Uh, and it, it's coming to us now here today to read to read these words. You have it there in verse one, the word of the Lord. You've got it again, verse four, the word of the Lord. So, what is it that this passage then says that's so important? Let's go in um, verse five first of all. And God brought Abraham forth abroad and said, "Look now toward heaven." And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So we're now switching to, to more spiritual descendants. We've Abraham's been promised he's going to have physical descendants numbered as the dust. Now he's going to have spiritual descendants, not directly from his blood, but um, united in faith, in, in hope and belief in, in God. Um, that These descendants uh, are going to be as numerous as the stars. And look at this important, this really important verse in verse 6. Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in these promises um, that God was giving to him. Uh, and so we come today, as we're, we're thinking about these things, we need to believe in these promises, these amazing promises, as I say, we're going to build up to, to show how they relate to us. Um, we come down to eight, verse 18 of the same chapter. Um, again, we have similar words. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant, a promise with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land uh, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And it carries on to say um, to all of this land uh, that is going to be given to, to Abraham's seed. Right, let's jump forward again now. We're going to come to, to Genesis 17. Now, this is the promises again repeated to, to Abraham um, in quite an amazing passage, really, that we have here. Uh, we'll read the, with the opening eight verses, first of all. When Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the, the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of uh, many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be Abraham. For the father of many nations have I made thee. So Abraham now becomes Abraham. He's the father of many nations as part of these promises. 
Let's carry on. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, uh, to be God, uh, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So some more amazing promises here given to Abraham that's built upon what he's already been told. Um, he's going to be multiplied. He's going to have all, all this seed that comes after him, all these descendants. He's going to be the father of many nations, now, now called Abraham. Um, he's going to um, be fruitful and have many blessings. Um, and there's going to be this everlasting uh, covenant that's promised forever. Um, and just as our first sort of digression here to show that this is these promises are, um, how do I say this? God's word, when we find something like the promises here, this is something that is consistent all the way through scripture and God weaves it beautifully through. You can pick up all these faithful characters and individuals who are looking at these same promises that we are reading now. These aren't just relevant to Abraham and us. They were relevant to everybody. And God's message has stayed the same from Genesis 12. Um, all the way through um, and there's a little link here with the I wills and I try to emphasize we have seven um, I wills and if we come to to Exodus chapter 6 we're going to see the same promises uh, subtly referenced and this now is to Moses so it's the same message God is repeating the same thing to these faithful characters so We've had seven I wills in Genesis 17 where God is saying, I will do this. I will make my covenant. I will make thee exceedingly grateful. I will establish my covenant between you. Seven times he says it. And then in Exodus chapter 6, um, we have the same repeated. I'll read the first eight verses. Um, the Lord said to Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand... Shall he let them go? And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. He's talking here about the people of Israel um, because they're currently captive in the, in the land of Egypt. And to those who, who know about these promises that we're reading from Genesis, it doesn't make much sense if the people are, are captive in, in Exodus. How can they be um, receiving these promises? Um, well, what does God say? God spake to Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah. And I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac, and to Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, uh, but uh, by my name Jehovah was I not known to them, and I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. Here's the promises that we're looking back at at the moment. The land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, I have remembered my covenant, those promises that he's made that we're reading of to Abraham and as we come on to, to Isaac and Jacob, God's remembering them. And then we have this same repetition of the I wills that we had in Genesis 17. We have seven times now from verse six. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord Jehovah and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretch out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into, in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. So we come back to Genesis 17 now. We that that little digression has shown how God is very specific um, with His Word and how He weaves these things together. Um, I don't think there's any coincidence there that the I wills match up, um, and He's pointing them back to these amazing promises that were given to Abraham and saying, "I haven't forgotten about these. Um, these are coming. You need to be faithful and trust in them, and trust in Me." So let's carry on through Genesis 17 because we get quite a lot from this chapter. 
So we're in verse 9 now. Uh, and there's a slight addition now to how God is going to um, uh, signify this covenant or promise. There's going to be a, a token is the word that, to look out for. So God said in verse 9 to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token, there's the word, uh, a sign, uh, a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child, your generations, in your generations, that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male um, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, um, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Um, so the circumcision on the eighth day, this is what affirms a covenant now. This is the sign uh, for mankind at the time. It's their token, as we saw the word, um, to sort of show and affirm the promise. And, and just to follow on this pattern of these promises being woven through, let's come back to, to Genesis chapter 9. We talked about it a little bit in the exhortation. Because we could say, well, the, these promises, they were new. They were given to Abraham um, in Genesis 12. Um, no, this was God's purpose all along. These promises have remained consistent and they remain consistent for us now. So we know in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it says Noah was saved the eighth person, okay? Just as on the eighth day we've just read in Genesis 17 was the circumcision. That was the sign of the covenant of the promise. And in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5, it's saying um, Noah was saved the eighth person. He was also a sign uh, of these same promises. Uh, and we had the word token in Genesis 17. We had about flesh being cut off. Uh, and we had that it was an everlasting covenant. Well, look in Genesis 9. Um, let's read, which verses should we go in at? We're going at verse 11. Um, God says, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off. There's one of our, our words. Any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more, any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token, there's the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a to for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting, as our third word, covenant, between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Just the same promises. Um, the same promises were given all the way back to Noah. So we see what was repeated, or what seems to have been given to Abraham. It was already there. Um, this is the beauty of God's word and the consistency of the God that we believe in. Uh, he hasn't changed. Um, he does not change and his promises remain consistent. So let's come back to Genesis 17 and we will just finish off um, what we were looking at there in that chapter with the, the last verses of this chapter. So that's going from verse 15 now. So Genesis 17 Verse 15, we have more promises now to Abraham. Uh, and God says to him, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and give thee a son of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is in a hundred... Uh, uh, that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, 
Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So here now we see the promise of a son to Abraham. We've had the promise of all these descendants uh, and this seed, both physically and spiritually. And we've had a promise of Jesus who's going to inherit the land. Um, and now he gets a promise of his own son, of Isaac. And he's going to be the same promises, it says, will be reaffirmed or established with Isaac, repeated by God to Isaac. Um, the same idea of being fruitful and multiplied and being a great nation. Um, so all these amazing things. Right, let's come forward to Genesis 22. We've got two more in Genesis to go to, and then um, we'll start heading to, towards the New Testament with a, a few little digressions along the way. So we're coming to Genesis 22 now. This is the chapter of the offering of Isaac. Um, quite a difficult chapter to, to read and understand. Molly and I don't have children, but um, for those that do, to picture what Abraham's asked to do here is incredibly challenging. Um, but I think Abraham understood when he's reading about the seed inheriting the land, he already knows that God is going to send Jesus. And I think this chapter um, just proves it for me, to be honest. Um, we see, uh, just bear with me while I find the verse, verse 8, there we go. Um, as they are going off, um, so that they, they've gone off to, to sacrifice Isaac. Um, and in verse 6, if we go back a little bit, Abraham's took the wood, laid it uh, upon Isaac, his son, and he's gone to take the knife. Um, and Isaac said unto Abraham his father and said my father and he said here I am my son he said behold the fire in the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering um, and this this is where we see in verse 8 Abraham's faith and that he understood that it was talking about Jesus these promises Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering so they went both of them together Abraham could see this lamb that God was going to have to provide his only son. Um, I think he believes in, in the resurrection as well because he knows he's going, he thinks he's going to, to offer Isaac in verse 5. He says that both him and the lad, both him and Isaac, they're going to, to come again. So he knows that Isaac will be resurrected um, to this future hope of the kingdom. So these amazing promises that God's giving, um, Abraham understands it's about Jesus. Uh, and not just his physical seed, um, Isaac, that is there. And if we look in, in Genesis 17 and 18, af in um, Genesis 22, verse 17 and 18, after this incident, and, uh, and obviously um, the angel says to Abraham, um, don't lay a hand on the boy, um, and he, he understands. He, he lifts up his, his eyes and sees the, thick, the ram caught in the thicket, and Abraham understands exactly what God is going to have to do uh, with his own son, uh, which has been promised to Abraham. And he, he then has reaffirmed these promises in Genesis 22, verse 17. God says, In blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. We have this same um, singular seed mentioned here, talking about Jesus, who Abraham understands God is going to have to offer up as a sacrifice. And the promise we see now is not conditional. Abraham has proved his faith through what he's done in this chapter. And God says, I will do this. This is going to happen. Um, so some quite amazing things that are given to him there. And again, we have a repetition of the seed as the stars and the sand. Um, nations being blessed so let's come forward now um, to our last one in Genesis and that's in Genesis 28 
So we've seen these amazing promises given to, to Abraham, uh, reaffirmed to, to Isaac. We've seen that these were the same promises given to Noah, um, the same promises repeated to Moses. Here we have them uh, reaffirmed to Jacob, the son of Isaac. So we see Genesis 28, uh, verse 3. God Almighty bless thee, bless Jacob, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. The same, same repetition of being fruitful and multiplied. Uh, and if we come forward to verse 13, um, we get more of the same promises. Behold, the Lord stood above um, the angels ascending and descending and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land, here's the promises repeated, the land on where you, where you lie, to thee will I give it and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. So they're all reaffirmed to Jacob. God is consistent and he repeats these same promises to this um, amazing line of people here. Um, and they, they appear now to Jacob. So let's come forward a bit. We're going to stop in 2 Samuel 7 uh, on our way to the, to the New Testament as we come to this crescendo that I mentioned. We're going to look at these promises as they are repeated to King David. And with each time, we seem to get a little bit more detail. God adds a little bit more for our understanding of what his promises were all about from the beginning of Scripture. Um, and we see God's consistent purpose and, and get little snippets of the beauty of it. So here, David get some, some amazing new details. In uh, 2 Samuel 7, and I'm going in at verse 9. Uh, I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies from uh, out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, and this is the promises being re reaffirmed, repeated to David, God says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, will plant and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed. And here's that same singular seed. Um, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. He will, and I will establish his kingdom. We think, oh, you know, it could be Solomon. But no, it's still talking about Jesus. Because look, verse 13. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The same everlasting promises that were given. I will be his father he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So some really amazing words that David has given. Um, you know, have this great name, this dwelling place, and this seed, Jesus, um, who's going to establish a kingdom forever. And God's going to be his father. He will be my son. It's the same things that, that Abraham uh, understood. I think it's why when we come to Matthew chapter 1, um, we see Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. These are the two that, that saw Jesus. They not, they're not exclusively, but they had these promises given to them and they could see that Jesus was, was going to come. And when he does, we see Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham at the start of that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. So let's come now to the New Testament. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We've seen these amazing promises given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We've seen that they were still all the way there at the start with, with Noah. We've seen that when the children of Israel were captive in the land of Egypt, 
that God repeats them to Moses and says, you know, they are going to inherit this land. I am God. I will do this thing. I've remembered my promises. We've seen the promises repeated to King David, um, who sees that this kingdom that Jesus is going to establish forever is amazing. Um, but it's not just limited to, to, to these characters that we've talked about here. These promises, I, I put it to you, are the fundamentals of um, the faith of these faithful individuals. And we come to Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, and we read about all these amazing people of, of Abel, of Enoch, of Noah that we've looked at, of Abraham and Sarah and, and Rahab, and David gets a slight mention at the end, all these amazing people. Um, and what does it say in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 11? What was the core of their faith? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, these promises that we've looked at, um, but having seen them afar off. They were persuaded by them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These amazing promises, this was the core of, of their life. They saw them afar off. They were excited about them. They made it the center of their lives. Um, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth because they were waiting for the promise of that future kingdom to come. Um, so all the faithful men and women of the Old Testament, this um, was what mattered to them, and this is what they understood was given to them by God. Even this morning on our exhortation, we looked at similar echoes, didn't we, of um, promises to Mephibosheth about not being cut off forever. It's all this beautiful repetition in the scripture. So let's come back to see, another, to, to see a New Testament example uh, in Luke chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, um, just to show that these are, are not promises for the Old Testament and don't matter to us. Um, they're not something we can be a part of. These are promises that matter to everybody. And they matter to New Testament characters as well. Uh, we talked about uh, John the Baptist a little bit this morning. This is um, his father at his birth, Zacharias. So, we're going in uh, to Luke chapter 1, having just talked about all the faithful men and women of old in the Old Testament. They all received the promises. Now, verse 68 of Luke chapter 1, we're going to go in that, which is Zachariah's song after his tongue has been loosed, after um, John has been born, and he, and he believes. What does, uh, what does he sing? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He hath visited and redeemed his people. And he hath raised, raised up a horn of salvation, that's Jesus, in the house of his servant David. He's already thinking back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, this horn of salvation in the house of his servant David, that, um, that king that was promised forever to be the seed of David. Verse 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. This, these are promises that have been since the world began, not that started and, and got changed. These promises have always been there. Uh, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us. Uh, God will perform the mercy promised to our fathers. He will remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Those promises to Abraham, those promises um, to David, those promises which have been since before the world began, Zacharias is rejoicing in here uh, at the birth of John, who is going to prepare the way for Jesus, that horn of salvation that was promised. Um, so quite amazing, really. So let's come to us. Let's come to Galatians. This is the crescendo that we're building to, these promises we've looked at that are consistent. Um, they talk about Jesus they talk about a land, about safety, about blessings, about the hope of a kingdom forever, um, eternal life. So what does it mean for us? Because um, we don't descend directly from Abraham um, like, like the, the, the Jews did. But we've talked already about this kind of idea of spiritual descendants being as the stars. So let's have a look at this in Galatians. So in Galatians 3, I'm just going to take um, some few verses and sort of paraphrase and, and explain what's going on here, what, what's being really helpfully pulled together, together for us here in Galatians chapter 3. 
I'll go in at verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. There's already our, our little guide that we are, or people can be the children of Abraham if they have faith. And the scripture in verse 8, for seeing that God would justify the, the Gentiles by faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And these amazing faithful characters, they understood this. It wasn't that salvation was closed to the Gentiles. All along, these promises um, were for everybody. Um, people like Rahab, who are mentioned in Hebrews 11, she understood. She wanted to be part of those promises so desperately that she risked her life when the spies came to Jericho. She cared so much about these promises that she'd heard about. Uh, and that's starting to get the lesson for us of how important we need to make these. Um, and it's just amazing that, you know, we can sit here and say, oh, how, how does it relate to us? Those promises didn't seem to relate to us. We don't descend from Abraham. Well, now we see the true meaning, the meaning that those faithful men and women understood all those years ago. And in verse 9, so then they which are of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. Um, those which believe they can be part of those same promises, direct descendant uh, or, or not, you know, the stars, the sand, all can be blessed with faithful Abraham. Let's come um, knowing that children of Abraham, we, we can be children of Abraham if we have faith. Um, I'll just uh, flick back quickly for you to, uh, don't worry about turning there, Luke chapter 19 is an example of this. Um, it's Zacchaeus, the, the man who he climbed the tree uh, to see Jesus um, because he was so excited to see him, to know what, um, to what he was talking about and to learn about those same promises because what does Jesus say to him in verse 9 of that Luke chapter 19? Today salvation has come to this house since he, Zacchaeus, also is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So we have this idea of those who believe being sons of Abraham. So verse 13 now uh, of Galatians chapter 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. So we have an opportunity to receive these promises through belief in Jesus. And we have the ability to look back and read about Jesus. Uh, these faithful men and women of old, they were seeing him in the future and could see his time and had the same opportunity, um, but had this incredible faith to be able to do that. So Christ died so that we could receive these promises. Verse 16. Now, I, I said all along that this, the word seed in these promises, it was singular. It was talking about Jesus and that I think Abraham understood that. What does verse 16 say? Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So to Isaac and Jacob, etc. But it says, uh, says not to seeds as of many, but as of one, to thy seed, which is Christ. Here we're told that seed that was promised, it was Jesus. That's what Abraham understood. Um, let's come forward a few verses to 20, verse 23. Before faith came, we were kept uh, under the law, shut up unto the faith, un under the faith which should afterwards be revealed, so that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the law, um, this was also this part of the same promises. To, it was supposed to lead to Jesus, to understand that it was through Jesus that mankind would receive salvation, would receive these promises that were given to Abraham. Um, and here's the crescendo. Here's the really exciting bit. Verse 27. As many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So that really is, is the amazing part. This is the, the amazing part of the promises that for us here today, if we have been baptised and we have faith in Christ, that it doesn't matter who we are, what our background is, whether we're male or female, rich or poor, 
we can all together be equal Abraham's seed and heirs of those same promises that were given to these faithful men and women of old. We have the same hope. Um, so why can we trust in God? Um, why can we believe that these promises would, would come true if, if you know, the scriptures themselves aren't enough to, to stir you up and think this is, this is something real. This isn't just someone writing something randomly down on a page. This is a woven message that's tied beautifully through here. This has to be inspired and from God. What do we read in Numbers 23, verse 19? It says, God is not man that he should lie, or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Similarly, we get in, in Titus chapter 1 uh, and verse 2, uh, that the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, picks up on this same idea. It was promised before the ages began. It was before Abraham. Um, it's always been part of God's plan, and God cannot lie. These things will happen, and we're still waiting for them to happen. Um, we can take comfort from prophecies that have come true. Um, I take comfort often from uh, my own prayers that I can see be answered, or people whose stories you talk to and they say, this was God working in my life, or something that, that I can't explain why that happened, except for God meaning for it to happen that there's a, a, a purpose for me. Um, I take all of these things as comfort that I can see God working. And so when I read these promises, um, I can understand that I have an opportunity, opportunity to be part of them. But that means baptism and it means faith in Jesus. And it means, as we read in Hebrews 11, with all these faithful men and women of old, putting those promises at the center of our lives and not having... Um, not that I'm saying it's wrong to have hopes and, and desires for, for our lives now, but to first and foremost want desperately to be part of those promises. Um, want that more than going to an F1 race that we joked about, for example. You know, that, you know it, it's easy to let things not have a perspective. It's fine to, to you know, look forward to things, but have that perspective of our, our end goal, these promises. This is what we need to focus on. This is what faithful men and women of old did. Uh, and they received those promises in faith, and, and, and so can we. And that's God's amazing promises.